Amuro Ray, the pilot of the legendary RX-78-2 Gundam and one of Gundam's top aces of all time. But even though his Gundam often gets a lot of credit for its incredible performance, by the end of the war it was actually quite the opposite. With his now awakened new type senses, the Gundam was now actively holding him back. Fortunately, Amuro wasn't the only one who realized this. Earth Federation engineers were also hard at work to come up with solutions for the new types within their ranks. The most impressive one was the development of the RX-78 NT-1, better known as the Alex Gundam. Because the Federation didn't have a good grasp of new type weaponry, they simply went with what worked. Basically, an overclocked RX-78-2 with magnetic coating to push its performance to the absolute limit. And this machine was to become Armro's personal machine during Operation Star 1, the battle for a Bawa coup. However, due to reasons, it never made it to the white base. So this leads us to the question, what would have happened if Armro had gotten this beast of a mobile suit? First of all, let's set the stage. How could Amuro have gotten the Alex in time? For this, I've come up with two scenarios that both have the same end result, preventing the Cyclops team from messing up the schedule. In the first scenario, Zeon simply never found out about the Alex. Either Federation secrecy was better or Zeon intelligence worse. But the most important thing is, the attack of the Cyclops team never happened, all those poor gyms were never wiped out, and the Alex's development was going according to plan. Then in the second scenario, we still have the Cyclops team's attack, but with one big difference. Rather than serving as target practice, the Jim Cold District types actually performed according to their specs, and managed to win a hard-fought victory over the Cyclops team. The important thing here is that these gyms were designed as a counter to the Dom. So given the power of the Cold District's type, it's well within reason to say that they could have fought off the Cyclops team, albeit with significant losses, but they could have still won. And the same would go for any subsequent scuffles regarding the Alex. So whichever one of these scenarios you prefer, the end result is that the Alex gets delivered at some point between Amro shooting down the Elmuth and Operation Star 1 commencing. So we've got the Alex on board of White Base. But now there's one more thing to consider before we get to the actual battle of Abawa Q. With Amro behind the controls of the Alex, who will become the RX-78-2's pilot? And our three main candidates are of course Sela Mas, Kai Shiden, and Hayato Kobayashi. And personally, I feel quite strongly about Sela. Kai's more cowardly nature makes him stay more in the back, making the gun cannon a natural choice for him. And for the record, Kai describes himself as a coward, so that's not me calling him out or something. As for Hayato, I feel that he's also better suited in his role as an artillery support unit, but then Sela, on the other hand, she's always been more on the front line with whatever fighter craft she's been piloting, and she definitely has the drive to pilot the Gundam. Additionally, with the learning computer now running at full force, she should be fine piloting the Gundam, even though she might not be completely used to piloting mobile suits yet. Another thing that definitely helps here is that the Gundam has a core fighter as a cockpit, just like the core booster, so she's not suddenly piloting a completely different machine. And talking about the core booster, that thing just became vacant. If only Wide Base had one more capable pilot on board. If only. So we have Amro in the Alex, Sela in the RX-78-2, Kai in Gun Cannon 108, Hayato in Gun Cannon 109, and Job John in the Core Booster. And so begins the Battle of Abawa-Q, the greatest battle of the One Year War. 
and for now things play out very similarly to how they did in the actual anime. As soon as a fleet containing White Base entered S-Field, Char and his 34th mobile suit team moved in to intercept them. And despite Amro's new machine, Char would be able to immediately sense that the new Gundam was being piloted by Amro and would try to fight him. Unfortunately for Char, Amro still had no intention of wasting any time on him, and now with the Alex, he could move away even faster to go help other Federation forces breaking through Abawaku's defenses. And once broken through, Char again found Amro, making Amro realize that unless he took out Char, he would just keep coming for him. Amro already had a relatively easy time keeping up with Char in the normal Gundam, but now with the Alex, he was able to completely outmaneuver Char. Using his speed and mobility, he wasted no time closing the distance, and unlike in the anime, Char simply did not have the speed or the acceleration to break away. Amro destroyed the Zeong's arm, pulled out one of his beam sabers, and slashed the Zeong in two. But Char wasn't down for the count just yet. What Amro didn't know was that the Zeong's cockpit was in its head and not in its waist. Char disconnected the head and flew back while simultaneously firing the mouth beam cannon, taking out the Gundam's head. In response, Amro tried shooting it down with his beam rifle, noticed that it was impossible to hit, and unleashed his arm-mounted Gatling guns. Unlike in the anime where this took place close to a Baoku itself, they were still in the middle of space, and with nothing to hide behind, Char was taken out in a hail of bullets. Having dispensed of Char, he continued taking out Xeon units to assist with breaking through Abawaku's defenses, which would also mean that Amuro was no longer the second Federation ace of the One Year War, but would become the top ace of the One Year War. And now let's quickly turn to the other wide base units and how their battle goes. Hayato and Kai just do their thing as usual without any real changes. They provide backup for wide base and help Federation troops trying to break through. Sela then is in charge of defending the wide base along with Job John, but unfortunately for wide base, her fate is essentially sealed. Try as they might, there was no way to prevent wide base's first engine from being taken out, so she would still crash land on a Bawaku. This would then again be followed by Bright recalling their mobile suits to assist in the defense of wide base. But this is where things would turn out quite differently. Originally, it was just Hayato, Kai and their gun cannons facing endless waves of Xeon machines until their own machines were shot down. But not only would they now have Sela on the inside and Job John on the outside of a Bawaku, but Bright could potentially also withdraw Amuro since he no longer had his hands full with Char. This meant that even though the white base was still heavily damaged, some of her units could have survived. This would most likely be a damaged Alex, a damaged RX-78 II, and one damaged gun cannon. Then the final person that would be majorly affected by Char's untimely death was Cassilia. In a way. She might not have been killed by Char, but looking at the welcome party surrounding her, I doubt she would have made it out alive anyways. At best, her ship would have been able to take out one or two Federation ships before being sunk itself, or another possibility is that the Federation would have tried capturing her as a quite high-profile zombie. But considering the real-life event that Gunnam is based on, I find it highly likely that Cassilia would have been tried as a war criminal and sentenced to death, especially considering that someone under her direct control was quite willing to break the Antarctic Treaty. Makuve, or she could have committed suicide to prevent all of this from happening. And then for the folks wondering what if Cassilia had survived that barrage, that'll have to be a video in and of itself. So as far as the One Year War is concerned, Amro getting the Alex wouldn't have changed that much. Char got killed and that's about it. However, in the post-war, this will literally change everything, so stay tuned for part 2 of What If Amro Got The Alex. For now, let me know in the comments down below what you thought about the events in this video and how you think it will affect the post-war. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters, I hope all of you watching have a great day, and I'll see you all next time!